Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Professor Yongjo Lee. Uh, I welcome all of you uh, to political economy of East Asian development. Uh, some of you may wonder why the title is not the fundamentals of East Asian uh, studies. Well, that's a good uh, question. Well, when I was uh, asked uh, to teach the course, I asked what the course should include, but uh, uh, there was no one who had a clue. There was no one who can tell me what should be included in the course. The former department chair uh, left for uh, sabbatical leave, and um, the current um, department chair uh, had no idea. Besides, the course has never been taught, so uh, department chair uh, gave me a free reign. Uh, I could design the course uh, as I liked. So um, after giving uh, some thought, I decided that um, uh, I teach a course on uh, East Asian uh, development, since I believe understanding and having knowledge of the uh, diverse uh, experiences of uh, East Asian countries with regard to development may provide foundations for those who study uh, East Asia. Uh, now, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, uh, the course. Basically, uh, this course compares development experience of uh, East Asian countries from a political economy perspective. I will tell you uh, later on what I mean by political economy uh, perspective. And you may ask why uh, East Asia? I can think of two reasons. First, uh, East Asia had been uh, the most dynamic uh, area in the 20th century, uh, economically and otherwise. Korean economy uh, just, uh, slowed down, and uh, uh, Japan uh, uh, has been going through uh, uh, stagnation uh, for some time, but before that, for several decades, uh, these countries were economically very, very uh, dynamic. And uh, the, of course, uh, even uh, politically, uh, these countries uh, uh, became uh, democracies. The second reason is that um, East Asia is a natural, a uh, laboratory of uh, different uh, political economic systems and uh, different strategies. So uh, countries adopted a different systems. So we can compare uh, systems. And uh, the, the same country adopted a different uh, strategies uh, along the way. So um, this fact, makes a good comparative study, uh, a very natural laboratory. Well, uh, in uh, physical sciences, uh, well, man can make a laboratory, but in social sciences, histories, we cannot make his, uh, lab. Uh, but um, uh, East Asia is uh, more or less a natural laboratory of different uh, systems, uh, different strategies. So uh, we can learn a lot about uh, uh, development from these uh, cases. And uh, the East Asian uh, uh, ex experiences pose many uh, theoretically interesting uh, puzzles. Well, uh, I said that East Asia uh, uh, had been a very dynamic uh, uh, area, region, but if we go back to the turn of the 19th century to 20th century, it was a different story. Only Japan succeeded in uh, modernization, while China and Korea uh, failed. Why? If China and Korea could modernize, develop, 
industrialized later on, why couldn't they uh, do that uh, early on? Uh, very interesting question. Uh, the second question, these are only examples. We uh, may address uh, more uh, puzzles and questions. Uh, anyway, the second puzzle is, uh, uh, what were the costs of uh, Japanese modernization and who paid them? If we look at uh, the whole reason, uh, the whole reason uh, was uh, very economically uh, dynamic, uh, uh, with the possible exception of North Korea. North Korea seems to be an exception that proves the rule. Uh, how? Why? What are the um, uh, what were special about uh, uh, East Asia uh, to for the reason uh, to be such a dynamic, so dynamic? And uh, of course, uh, in some countries, uh, the inequality. Uh, uh, level is alarming uh, these days, but uh, if you you take a look at the, especially the uh, capitalist um, East Asian countries, uh, well, they grew without creating a serious uh, uh, level of uh, uh, inequality. So, what explains this uh, growth with uh, equity? This is a very unusual, and um, uh, in uh, East Asia, uh, some uh, regimes were authoritarian, uh, some regimes were democratic, uh, or some countries uh, had the authoritarian regime, and then uh, the democratic regime. So. Uh, Given the experience of, of uh, uh, these countries, uh, which regime uh, is better for economic development, authoritarianism or democracy? And uh, if we look at the case of uh, Korea and Taiwan, the authoritarian regimes uh, performed very well in terms of uh, 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 economy. But uh, despite uh, these, this brilliant economic performance, uh, these authoritarian regimes collapsed. Why? Uh, uh, and uh, now uh, the last, but uh, not in the least, why uh, has uh, North Korea alone uh, failed to uh, develop? Uh, Okay, now um, I'm going to uh, discuss what I mean by political economy perspective. The, we are approaching uh, the diverse development experience in East Asia from a political uh, uh, economy perspective. Well, basically, political economy uh, approach supposes bi-directional interaction between politics and economy. Okay, there are there are some uh, uh, scholars who try to explain the economic uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, in terms of uh, political factors. Uh, there are also uh, some scholars who try to explain the political developments in terms of uh, economic uh, factors. Well, uh, I'm not uh, denying their contributions. We learn a lot from them, but we suppose uh, in this course, we are trying to look at the economic impact on politics 
as well as the political impact on economy. So we are not trying to reduce one to the other. Uh, we are looking at the bi-directional interaction and influence between politics and uh, economy. Okay, we are going to look at the bi-directional interaction and influence between politics and economy. Then what are they? That is the big question. Let me uh, discuss economy first. What is economy? Well, economy concerns meeting the material needs of the society or community. So we need a lot of things, a lot of goods and services. And uh, somehow we have to get these goods and services. How? Well, first, we have to produce goods and services. And then uh, these goods and services have to be distributed uh, among those who need them. But how do you organize the productive uh, activities and the distributive uh, activities? That's the real uh, question. One of the readings I assigned the Heilbronner's uh, The Making of the Economic Society uh, discusses uh, this issue uh, in uh, chapter one. Well, he identifies three main agents or methods of uh, organizing economic activities, which mean uh, productive activities and the distributive uh, activities. The first is a custom, the second state, and third is market. Well, uh, customs uh, are still uh, re resorted to to organize economic uh, activities uh, in uh, some primitive societies, uh, even today. Heilbronner uh, uh, comes up with the example of the uh, Kung tribe uh, in the Kalahari Desert, but uh, in some other uh, societies too, uh, customs are used to organize uh, economic activities. A good example is uh, the caste system uh, that uh, is used in uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. Well, foreigners often assume that the caste is a simple uh, social status system. Yeah? Brahman, Kshatriya, uh, blah, blah. But actually, caste system is more than that. There are thousands of different castes uh, in these societies. So um, it was, uh, uh, well, society needs uh, to meet material uh, needs, satisfy material needs. How? Well, it needs, um, well, in, uh, in these societies, customs are still used uh, to divide labor. So if you are born into a washing caste, then uh, it is highly likely that uh, you end up becoming a washer uh, yourself. Uh, well, caste is no longer enforced by law. Uh, it is, uh, in, in most cases, it is prohibited, but uh, customarily, uh, the, the custom uh, still survives in some pockets of the society. Uh, with the possible exceptions of these uh, 
uh, countries, custom is rarely used to organize economic activities. So the main agents of organizing economic uh, activities are state and market. Well, uh, the organization of a production of goods and services may be left to the market, right? market exchange. Uh, or the state may intervene by owning the means of uh, uh, production. On the other hand, the state may also uh, involve itself in distribution of the produced uh, goods and services. Or uh, the market may play the uh, large role in distributing the produced goods and uh, services. And uh, by dividing up the, the economies into uh, uh, this, the four categories, and uh, when the ownership resides, ownership of a means of a production uh, is public, and the state also uh, involves itself in distribution, that is uh, communism. On the other hand, both the production and the distribution of goods and services are left largely to the market uh, uh, exchange. We may call the system capitalism or market economy. And there are uh, mixed economies as well. Well, on the one end, uh, the means of production is privately owned, but the state uh, intervenes deeply in distribution. That is uh, the, the, the uh, welfare state type, state type uh, mixed economy. On the other hand, uh, while the means of production is publicly owned, uh, the, the state does not involve itself heavily in the distribution of the produced goods and services. This is another type of a mixed economy, which is often called market uh, socialism. So this is uh, the point. Well, oftentimes, uh, the, uh, even uh, the, among scholars, uh, they equate the state with politics and market with the economy. But that is not the case. Uh, uh, well, uh, the state, uh, of course, uh, plays important role, economic roles in the communism and the mixed economies. Even in the capitalist society, uh, in many countries, uh, uh, state uh, owns, uh, well, uh, some uh, uh, industries. Uh, and uh, the state also intervenes uh, uh, quite uh, extensively through various welfare uh, programs. So uh, it is not the market alone. Market alone is not economy. The state is an integral element of uh, uh, economy. Economy involves both the state and the market. Uh, what is politics? Economy was uh, relatively uh, easy to uh, define, uh, but uh, defining politics is uh, much trickier than defining economy.
when I was an undergraduate student, uh, we often uh, we were often told that uh, if there are 100 political scientists, uh, then uh, uh, there could be uh, 100 different uh, definitions of uh, politics. But anyway, uh, a scholar uh, named Mason uh, looked at all different uh, uh, views of politics, and uh, he distilled uh, the, uh, the four different uh, views uh, of politics out of the myriad uh, different uh, definitions. The first view is uh, the exercise of uh, state power view. Uh, in this view, any issues, relations, or institutions that are related to or aimed to influence uh, the exercise of the state power are political. The second is a, a, a power view. Politics is defined by power relations in this view. Any phenomena that are significantly shaped by power are political. The third view is a conflict view. The essence of a politics is conflict in this view. Any situations that involve classes of interest, desires, policy preferences are political. And the fourth view is allocation of values view. Politics in this view is concerned with the distribution of scarce values any methods, ways of allocating scarce values are uh, political. You may think that uh, these four different views are quite distinct, uh, quite different uh, from uh, each other, but that is not the case. Well, Conflicts arises out of uh, scarcity of values, and power, public or private, is used to deal with conflicts. And uh, the state embodies the highest level of power, the highest dependent power relations. So you can reconcile these four different uh, uh, views of politics. Well, uh, political systems can be distinguished uh, on the basis of um, uh, these. Uh, so the first criterion is uh, on what the public power is based? Is it based on consent of the ruled, consent of the governed, or uh, the public power simply assumes, self-assumes uh, the power? So those political systems that rely, that bases the authority of a public power on the consent of the governed, uh, on the consent of the ruled, uh, are called democracies. And uh, political systems uh, that whose authority is not based on the consent of the governed, consent of the ruled, uh, is called authoritarianism. And then even these can be uh, distinguished depending on the how 
interests are articulated. Interests are aggregated and then uh, they are expressed uh, uh, and they are delivered to government, to politicians. So, um, in one type of uh, political systems, interest uh, articulation is left to the community, left to the society. So all different uh, interests may compete to get attention. Uh, so uh, it, on the other hand, in some countries, uh, all the representation or articulation of interest is uh, uh, monopolized by a state-sanctioned organization, a single uh, state-sanctioned organization. So, uh, uh, so only one organization can aggregate and articulate uh, interests of certain uh, groups. Uh, and even uh, here, depending on uh, whether the uh, authority is uh, based on uh, consent of the rule, uh, we can distinguish uh, state corporatism and uh, uh, so societal corporatism. Here, basically, the direction of uh, flow uh, is from bottom to the top. Uh, in the case of state corporatism, uh, the state, the interest of the state takes precedent of the uh, those of the uh, society. So, politics expressed in the mathematical uh, formula, it is a function of a community or society and the state. These are the two fundamental uh, interests. So these are two. So as we have seen, the state alone is not uh, does not embody uh, politics. Politics uh, uh, involves uh, community. Community or society is an integral uh, element of uh, politics. And uh, as we can see here, the state is a key element in economy and it is also a key element in uh, politics. So this, this tells the centrality of the state, centrality of the state. Uh, of course, um, these three are analytical constructs. Uh, okay, for example, people in the community are the same uh, economic agent, the same people in the market. In the market, they become an economic agents. And in the community, they became a member of the society. So actually, they are the same ones, but Analytically, they can be distinguished. In the course of um, the semester, uh, we are going to pay much attention uh, to the roles uh, the state played in uh, East Asian uh, countries. Uh, the reason is uh, simple. In late development, or late, late development, the state has to play a very impo important role. The scholar who emphasized the developmental role played by state uh, 
uh, was uh, uh, Alexander Gershenkron. Gershenkron was an uh, economic uh, historian uh, who taught at Harvard University. Well, in 1952, he published a very important uh, article titled Economic Backwardness in Historical uh, Perspective. Uh, later, that article was included uh, in his book uh, titled The Same, Economic Backwardness in Historical Perspectives. Well, uh, he was uh, the, he did many empirical studies of uh, investigation process of European countries, and on the basis of these uh, case studies, he made uh, very interesting observation. Uh, and uh, he mentioned that uh, in certain circum circumstances, there were advantages from a late start into industrialization. Uh, so in economically backward uh, countries needed to leave the gap of uh, knowledge and practice that separated them from the advanced nations. But if these and other problems could be overcome, uh, success for the later comer to industrialization was rewarded uh, by propensity toward the more rapid power, uh, rapid growth. Uh, as we shall see, later developed countries or later, later the developing countries uh, need uh, much larger uh, capital, need much larger capital uh, than the early or developer. The reason is simple. Well, in the case of um, the later developers, because there are the com competitors in the earlier uh, developers, so uh, they, to compete against uh, these earlier developments, they have to make larger investments uh, to achieve a scale economy. Uh, so um, in the case of uh, uh, later developers like uh, France and Germany, uh, the state um, built, um, set up a investment bank or industrial banks to mobilize capital uh, for the uh, enterprises. Uh, in the case of uh, late, late developers, uh, the capital requirements were even larger. So uh, the state had to take on the, uh, uh, the task of industrialization upon uh, itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, the state uh, was, in the case of Japan, the state set up uh, model factories uh, the, um, by importing uh, the machinery and the skilled workers from abroad. And then uh, they um, had uh, the local workers uh, learn uh, the skills on the jobs. So once that is uh, uh, done, the, um, these model uh, plants were exorbitantly low prices to the entrepreneurs. So this was how um, uh, the entrepreneurial class was uh, built. Anyway, um, in the entrepreneurship is uh, more desperately needed. Uh, um, so capital is a serious problem, but capital uh, is a less serious problem than lack of uh, entrepreneurship. So, um, uh, and um, 
because of the lack of uh, entrepreneurship, um, the state uh, uh, had to uh, involve itself uh, in the creation of uh, these uh, uh, skills. Uh, this uh, I already uh, explained. So now, uh, requirements and uh, grading. Well, it's uh, uh, simple. You are expected to attend the class uh, on a regular basis, and you are expected to participate actively in class discussion. Uh, each so. Uh, the two uh, accounts for 20% toward the final uh, grade. Students uh, take a meet and the final uh, uh, exam, uh, which counts 30% uh, toward the final grade. And uh, you are expected to write a uh, term paper. The total is 100. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any uh, questions, please leave uh, uh, your message. You can write uh, to me directly, or you can leave the questions uh, below the YouTube uh, window. Okay, I'll see you on Thursday.